I have a Sony D250 Discman portable CD player from about 1989 here. Um, this was something I spotted on eBay doing the usual uh, looking for interesting broken things. Uh, a few good few months ago, I think it was sometime last year as I was shooting this, and it's been one of those projects that has been, well, potential projects that's um, been kind of put aside while uh, I was working on a few other things because this is a personal project and I was working on a few for money and a few for other people and a few other things as well that weren't repairs. Uh, so yeah, this has been sat in a box kind of waiting for an ideal time to take a look at it. Um, one of those things, as I often say about some of these smaller devices that you can't get across on camera, is tactile sensation. Um, this is uh, metal bodied and has a little bit of reassuring weight to it and a really lovely feel, very similar to that 1991 Walkman, this WM190, I think it was. That's right, um, is much lighter. I don't think I have a battery in it at the moment, but uh, hopefully not, so I've not used it for a while, nope. Uh, but again, the tactile sensation of, of this is very satisfying and I really like the clean angular design and the contrast of the kind of black and silver. Um, just think it's really classy and a really lovely example of Sony at some of their best. So when I spotted this, I started looking at a couple of the models. This, by the way, in North America, I believe it was known as the D25. And I think it had a slightly different uh, clear window on the door. I think it was on one side rather than being along the bottom like this on the um, North American version. Um, but yeah, this sort of design was used across a, a few of their models. And uh, yeah, I picked this up and just thought, yeah, this looks, this looks lovely. Um, because it's an earlier model, it won't really have any kind of shock protection or anything like that. And it actually takes a proprietary battery that this doesn't come with. Thankfully, because it doesn't come with it, the battery contacts are very clean. And um, there's actually, inside it, there's a, a date written with some Japanese text on there. So I'm not sure if this battery door was sourced from another model or sourced more recently but anyway let's get on with it one thing i noticed when i first got this is that the door is a little bit stiff to open because it's binding a little bit against this front edge and i think that's because someone's been in this before and if it will come across on camera there i'm not really sure but this front panel looks to be at a slight angle and it looks to be pushed back kind of that way a little bit so it's causing this control part here to bind a little bit against the front of this case the case itself looks straight so i don't think the whole thing's been bent but yeah something's something's up here because uh i can also see i think what's caused it is there's a little kind of latch here a little tag that should be pushed I think underneath or inside this control cavity and it's outside of it so someone's been in it and not put it back together properly. Um, I have, because it's got a 9 volt input on the back, I have tested this and uh, as per the description uh, it doesn't work. There is a very common fault on these that could be the issue in this one which typical Sony it's to do with plastic gears there's a little arrangement of plastic gears that are used on the laser sled assembly and uh, it's very common one for the grease that's used around that assembly to seize up and two if it's over exercised with seized grease or just due to age and temperature changes the gears can crack there are aftermarket gears available, so I can see myself probably ordering one of those. I'm not sure if there should be some kind of hinge on the inside of the door. I think on this side, because there's a fix in here and a slot here, 
it's missing on this model. It's not hopefully critical. I don't think there's any interlock switches here. I think it's actually down here where there's a little stem that protrudes off the door here that pushes the interlock switch. So hopefully I just have to be careful with it. It's a shame it's missing that, but it's not critical. There are a couple of little marks and bits and bobs. I don't think I've cleaned it or anything with it. I've just briefly inspected it when I've got it, tested it, and then put it in a box waiting for the time. So it's cool that it's got the original uh, It's a Sony sticker, even if it's not quite straight. Uh, <laughs> slightly annoying, but I'm not, I won't lose sleep over it. But it'd be lovely to get this to work. Uh, so yeah, let's see if we can pop a few of the screws out. I'm seeing some tiny, probably JS screws uh, next to the headphone socket and underneath that, ah, because it's Sony, of course, it's got the arrows that point where the casing screws are. So it's pointing to ones at the back where the hinge is. Uh, one there, one there, one there. Move the battery door, whoops, that's just gone on the floor. One inside the battery compartment, and one there. Let's get the bottom panel off. I'm using a triple zero JS bit. Let's see if these are all the same. Well, those two are so far. One inside the door. I'm checking all of these because we know what Sony are like for tricky bits. Okay, so there's a little plastic piece inside the door. Definitely experience from that Walkman was let's use 30 different kinds of screws, why not? I think all of these casing screws look the same so far. Yeah. Uh, that's everything from the bottom and then there are two on the back. Nothing the same. Oh, there are three on the back. I've just spotted another. There's one by the line output socket. Spotted another arrow. Yep. Cool, okay. What's that? <laughs> Mystery liquid. All right. Marvel of miniaturization. So I can see down here, likely the gears in question and, uh, yeah, it's shattered. So, uh, there is a soldered ribbing cable covering them up. Slightly annoying. Will I be able to get that in shot? I think I will recompose my shot and show you what I've just spotted. So hopefully you can see where my thumb is. There's a white gear on the motor and then a kind of green and yellow gear and a chunk has snapped off of that gear. Now that is the one. The little one on the motor and that one in the middle especially are the ones that are known to break. Now I was expecting to sort of break around the the shaft but I wasn't expecting a chunk snapped off it. Uh, but that obviously means the motor will be just freewheeling because the teeth are not meshing. So definitely going to need to order some gears. So uh, just give that a little nudge with a cocktail stick. Yeah, the motor is free to turn. 
that's fine. Where it can seize up is the rails of the sled. Uh, the grease can dry out and on the worm gear there, this, the grease can dry up which puts extra tension on these plastic gears which are already nearly 40 years old. Crikey. So yeah, it puts extra stress on something that's already of an age. We'll all get there at some point. And uh, they crack. So that's definitely an issue. And yeah, what we were saying about sort of signs of someone being in this. That front still feels like it's catching a little bit. Just see if that control part will just drop down a tiny bit. Yeah, I feel like the edge of the door there look is not is not level. I wonder if we've got a slight bend at the hinge. Definitely not quite right, is it there? And on the opposite side, it's fractionally off there, so we've probably got a slight bend at that hinge somewhere. Wonder if anything can be done with that. It looks like it's two boards. See this this board here, and I can see another board underneath. I can see yeah, a connector going to that board, so they run the display, probably the display controller, it might be the general microcontroller, because I can see traces going to the display, this chip here. Then we've got yeah, the transport controls, that cable there, uh, it's coming down to the other board as well. And then of course we've got a little power board at the back with some contacts here. I assume, I believe a, a car dashboard kit was made for this model. I assume that is where the dashboard dock that it sits on made contact, but I haven't found any specific mention of that connector. It's got to be, it's got to be because it's on the bottom, it's got to be what the unit sits on and must have some kind of power connection. Uh, to the dock, but I've not seen anything document it. It's just a little bit of dust in the back of the uh, sled there as well. So let's just see. Is that? Let's just see. Is that free to move? Yeah, I can't move that at all. Just gonna put. A drop of GT85 into that. Let's see if it may penetrate that grease a little bit. Same there. I'm going to try removing the actual transport Ooh, okay, so there's a spring under there under each one Is that actually tell me there's another one of this go? Oh, there's another one hiding under this ribbon cable. I have a feeling I might have to desolder that. Okay, so three transport bolts. I think as well this board has to come out because there's a a bracket. So there are two tiny silver screws. All in this bracket, in this board. A little black screw inside as well. 
so I've nothing to do with it. That is like the case screws, but it's longer. Where that broken gear is, it is smashed to pieces. But I'm just trying to sort of push on it a little bit, not push on the good gears, but push on that one to get the see it rotating just to get the uh, worm gear to free up a bit and it's it's getting there just to get some of that gt85 to penetrate in there a bit and then i think we'll end up cleaning that worm gear out with alcohol and then re-greasing it but just using the broken gear to uh, exercise it a bit yeah, that's feeling better. Another piece of the ear breaking off there. It's turned to cheese, it's much like that Philips. <laughs> much like that uh, Philips boombox that I worked on. Yeah, this gear's just crumbling. It's interesting that there is a sort of green. I wonder if there is some sort of grease impregnated into this plastic, it's just crumbling. But it is. Yeah, I've got movement now on that sled at last. So yeah, I think at this point, give it a little bit more. The trick I find is not to uh, spray it directly into the thing so it will go everywhere, but spray it on a paper towel or rag and then let it drip out the end of the straw to where you want it to go all right so good news i've managed to free up that laser slide and uh yeah moving quite easily in the process of doing that i've mashed that gear even more it really doesn't matter because it's sacrificial in this case i don't want to wreck the other gears in the kit that I'm about to order, I believe there's a motor gear, the little one. So we'll probably have a look at that with a microscope camera and just see if there's any splits or anything in it. But clearly the middle gear, which always seems to be the, the troublesome one, is treated differently or made of a different plastic because it's a completely different colour. It's got this green all over it. I don't know if that's some grease or treatment or is that kind of an oxide byproduct of the plastic reacting maybe with the metal uh, clip ring or maybe with the metal shaft there I don't know but it's obviously a very different genetic makeup to uh, whatever the other two gears are which should be uh, either nylon or delrin uh, I believe in most cases, but yeah, at least now we've got the sled free to move. So I've just put a tiny drop of um, uh, the PTFE spray GT85 um, just on this side and then a few bits in all the interconnecting bits on this side. As I say, it will probably be completely cleaned and re-greased with fresh grease, but just to get this freely moving uh, so that we can get the replacement gear in. This is the annoying part where this ideally one day project comes to a grinding halt because now I've got to order the uh, gear set and they're only available from either the Czech Republic or China so uh, it's going to be put aside for a little while but when we're ready to come back to this there's lots of swarf from this crack gear hanging out around the other gear and around the bottom of this that we'll want cleaning out I think I'm going to put those screws back in this board and the black screw back in from the inside because I, I don't think it's actually necessary in fact I might even put in the transport screws might put them back in because I don't think again it was massively necessary I think m more importantly if I have to come to do it will be to desolder this cable because this cable's annoying it's in the way I don't want to keep kind of bending it this way uh, it's also covering up these tiny pink wires here that I think go to the motor that I don't want to snag on anything so i've got to be careful with those so this could end up being desoldered from here it's taking a bit of time to get back to the discman again and i've realized that uh, i don't have to take the long screw out of 
the other side to get this board loose nor do I have to take one off the back which I thought for a moment that I did the reason it's a bit hard to get out at first is this ribbon cable that's underneath it this one goes to this board but it's stuck down to this sort of silver piece of uh, the in, the kind of internal chassis uh, so the kind of fold of that cable pushes if you can see that kind of pushes right into the corner of that chassis so I think what I'm gonna have to do is carefully sort of peel that cable peel that glue off whilst trying not to pull it from the other side it's coming that's it yes and then we carefully sort of fold that out of the way have to be careful with the uh, solder joints on that so that does give me a little more access so I've just switched to the uh, close-up camera here I'm sorry this wobbles a little bit um, I haven't really found a solution for that yet probably a better arm by the way the arm mounts would be better on the desk but either way I've gone for the um, close-up cam because I'm going to try and find on this this should be a split uh, in this ring there's a lot of crap obviously on here that you can now really see but somewhere I'm trying to shine a torch on it because this should be yeah I can see it's on the bottom I think just facing away from me I think it's there on that side so I need to try and rotate that to get the split ring off definitely this green stuff all over this gear I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's supposed to be like that I think that's a byproduct of uh, it's decomposing it doesn't look like the uh, does it look like the rings turning should I copy it a little bit if I can get that round to the top Yes, there it is. Look, you can see the split in the ring. Just there. Now I've got to try and do this without uh, the thing flying across the room. Famous last words. I think I'm going to have to pull up the chair. There we go. We can better see that now. So I've got to try and get into that uh, ring and open this up. Cut it. Look at that. The gunk on it is actually uh, helping me out, if anything. So I've got the ring off the front. I've got this kind of half balanced on a towel to uh, get the angle on it. So hopefully that means the remainder of this gear <laughs> that's already in pieces should just pull off. Yeah, it's coming. Well, it's coming in pieces but it's coming off I'll have to break it up actually to get it past this the question is how easy is this going to be when we actually come to fit the new gear because it's not going to mesh around any other gears but we've got to get around this how are we going to tackle that one come on yeah there we go Another Gorgonzola special. So there's all these little bits now. I have to try and clean up and get out of here. But oh, look at the state of that. Let's put that into focus. Yeah, that's. Um, what is that? Because I suppose, I guess it must be the same grease because this gear is what's attached to the actual worm for the sled. 
but this is the intermediate shaft so I'm assuming they use the same grease I've ordered by the way I've been recommended um, a molly coat grease there's a specific model number that I've uh, forgotten I'll put it up on the screen I looked up what was best to use for laser sleds and apparently Philips favoured a specific molly coat which you can get in really tiny tubs or really massive industrial tubs for about 800 quid if you so desire I was wary of um, lithium grease because it can damage plastics I was wary of silicones because silicones can uh, or silicone I should say because it can outgas and it can fog up optical assemblies that's why you shouldn't apparently use silicon uh, sealants or adhesives in camera lenses and of course we've got a laser lens so uh, it made sense I'm trying to get that hair out whatever it is uh, it made sense to uh, not use silicon so the molly coat is apparently a synthetic like a PTFE based compound that's recommended by Philips apparently Philips used it on all their uh, on all their CD players so it was available we'll go with that so we need to clean this up so I've cleaned up the little brass shaft here and you can probably see that uh, there's quite a bit of oxidization uh, on the surface of that I'm hoping that's not going to affect uh, when the new gears on there it won't get any extra friction this will all be re-greased with the uh, molly coat when it's uh, when it's done but yeah it's uh, a bit unusual that they didn't like the motor shaft there for example was made out of the pardon steel that's been polished this is made out of brass I'm wondering if the little um, spring clip that goes on the front might be steel and I'm wondering if there's been a reaction between the two kinds of metal that's been accelerated by the grease and over time that's just made it go all green and horrible um, it's also in close proximity to the battery bay because the terminals are right there so could have been a little bit of outgassing of the battery it's a bit hard to say something else of interest is this little uh, spring clip which I've just stuck on a mirror and just dropped some alcohol in it and you can see all the grease and stuff that the kind of bubble of alcohol is uh, is all dissolving I ought to put this in a little shot glass or something really to try and clean it I'm wary of cleaning it on a flat surface because it's likely to just disappear so I thought I'd just try and dissolve all the stuff off it with uh, alcohol rather than trying to scrub it and risk losing it but yeah that is weird all right switch into the close-up cam for a bit because the gears have arrived and they look great actually they didn't take that long to come either um, about 11 days from China uh, which is great I've had some stuff lately take a really long time uh, you know it's kind of UK stuff really it's kind of alright if you know something takes 11 days from China it's not really alright if it takes 11 days from Cheadle so yeah it was nice that that was a little bit quicker so um, my plan is uh, I've also got the molly coat grease so um, I experimented with cleaning some of the old grease off uh, the brass uh, worm gear here and uh, I'm going to clean the rest of this off so I'm going to have to do kind of one half of it and then wheel the uh, laser assembly to the other end of the sled uh, so I can do the other half so I'm going to do that and then I'm going to do fresh grease and then I am going to do a little bit of grease on the shaft on this put the new gear on a little bit of grease on the gear make sure it's all free to move and it's all happy and then we'll try powering it we'll get it to run up and down the sled a little bit ideally and then see if it works I have no idea about the rest of the condition of this thing electrically I know I've been able to get this motor to move I know the displays come on but I don't know what life is left in the laser I don't know what the alignment's like I don't know if it has any servo issues I've no idea first things first we've got to get this to be able to move and then we'll see if the laser focus is working and if it just might play a CD we'll find out two things I've got to be careful of here one is that I don't want it to get this full of fluff so I'm going to make sure that if it leaves any fibers behind they're taken care of and also this ribbon cable 
I've got to be uh, careful with that, so I've got to go steady with this. But yeah, I definitely want to get all that old gunk out of there, really. I could use something like acetone that could be more aggressive, but that is likely to wreck the ABS that the frame is made of, wreck this cable potentially, yeah, just a bad idea, so we'll just go with isopropanol and just carefully do it. See, it's grumbling at me now a little bit to get to the end stop because there's no grease there. <laughs> Well, that's better. Now it's been exercised a little bit. Yeah, that's much better. So all that dried grease is gone. So we'll let that dry out and get the new grease in there. Let's see a little bit there. Out comes the mollycoat and so I've had a little pick around this with a toothpick and I didn't find any fibres or anything. I think we should be fine. So I think we'll start with the slit in the middle actually. Just do a little coating on this. I think I'll just try and sort of get a good coating in the in the thread of it the way it was. I'm gonna go overboard. So I'll go by it, feel it really, make sure there's enough at the end. Yeah, that seems alright, feels good. Yeah, that feels nice and easy to move. So with some use that should just spread across there pretty well. So I think what I want to do is probably wheel it up to the end wipe my hands. I will be washing this towel after. And let's have a look at these gears. They look great to me. Don't think I'll be using a small one. I will keep it. But I think the one on the motor is fine. I'm going to pop the small one back in the bag. To get a little bit of the grease on there. the clearance I'm not sure I think this retainer will probably have to come out uh, I can, hmm. maybe bend it out of the way Sure. I sure I can get that far enough out of the way. Very, very, very close. Oh. Very close. Oh. oh, oh, got it, I think. It's going, it's going. Okay, I think I've got it mesh with the motor. While I'm not working in a bit, it feels a tiny bit stiff. As if the diameter of the new gears are a little bit off. Uh, I have got it. It's a bit further back than that. What's that about? Right. I think that's right. It's meshed. It's done it. See if some of the grease will wick through a tiny bit. It may be a 
can't kind of wears in, I don't want to be pulling on those teeth like that. Yeah, I can see there's just enough. Let's see if I can get a shot of that on the camera. You can hopefully see there, there's just enough of it exposed where we have to get the clip ring around it. It may just want, it may just be tolerances that it just wants wearing in a little bit. It just felt tight to get it on there. But it is, it's going, it's moving. Try and exercise it a little bit. As I say, I don't want to be doing this too much with the teeth. Let's put a little bit of grease on the front. That's too much really. Take that off. Before the clip ring goes on it, I'll be wanting to test it all on the eye. Just been sort of working this back and forth a bit. I think it's getting easier. I think what I probably should have done is maybe polished that uh, brass shaft a little bit because it's probably the oxide on that that's ever so slightly changed the tolerances. I don't want to just bind power straight on this because if it's stiff to drive it the motor will draw excess current and then you risk burning out the H bridge uh, which is the transistor arrangement that drives the power to the motor so I'd rather physically get it it feels way better now I'd rather physically get it shifting a bit more and kind of worked in a bit more and then I don't think we're far off trying power but as for the actual you can actually see slightly there, is there maybe a slight, I don't know, it might just be the camera, it almost looks like there's a slight elliptical edge to the gear, I don't think there is, I think they're just straight gears, but they're beautifully made, uh, I assume they're moulded from polyurethane, like uh, much like those Philips gears, replacement gears were, um, yeah I just thought it would sort of slide straight on the shaft a little bit easier than it did but I think it's just tolerances as I say I probably should have polished that a bit first but it's feeling much better now it's just doing this for a while and uh, getting it as kind of free as possible before uh, I put power on it I think we're probably about ready to so I'm going to wind it up to one end trip the door interlock and then see if it pulls the uh, laser right back down to the bottom of the sled where the limit switch is. Okay there's a bit of a power lash up. I've got a CD in it and it's on the bench power supply at 9 volts. I did quickly try it off a 9 volt battery but on my 9 volt batteries I've got to hand her a little bit flat. I think it's pretty strict about the current that it wants off a, a 9 volt input so a battery won't well a 9 volt battery pp3 won't quite cut it and put the power on and we're drawing 40 milliamps i'm going to press play oh oh It's having a go, and I don't think it quite made it to the, the start, did it? Let's try again. No, it won't. Let me cycle it. Might want to be reset. 40 milliamps again. It's certainly having a go, isn't it? I wonder if you've got focus issue. Let's try again. The backlight on the screen's working as well. It's kind of. Actually, that's, that's crapping out a little bit as well. I wonder if uh, it's got a current drawer issue. Oh, I see the issue. My supply is too low. The current draw, the current uh, limit is too low. 
almost. Oh, it's drawing quite a bit of current. When uh, that sounds like it's playing, that sounds like it's working. It's drawing quite a bit of current when it spins up. It's settling down a bit now. We're drawing about 200 milliamps at 9 volts. I mean, I know it's an old player, so the power draw will be heavy. It's coming up to about 270 milliamps there. Let's cut the power on that. Reset. Yeah, that one's a lot when it spins up. We have backlight on the display and the counters go in. That's working. <laughs> Can I get to the skip buttons? Oh. That's going. That motor sounds a little bit grumbly. Counters are absolutely shut up, that's working. <laughs> Can you hear it ticking ever so slightly? But again, I think that might just want exercising a bit. But that's having no trouble locking. And it's upside down with a little light pouring into it. Let's just try its audio output. Right, I can't include any of that because of copyright. I don't know if I've got anything I have the copyright for on CD. I might do later. Um, pot's very crackly, the socket's very crackly, but it's working. Um, no, can't hear any skipping. It's upside down. <laughs> but it's tracking, it's working. I do think still this wants exercising a bit. Uh, as I said, the more, yeah, it's feeling better and better and better. We just probably program it and let it run between track one and final track a few times and just, we just keep skipping it. But I think, as I say, I probably should have, yeah, I probably should have polished that shaft a little bit, but I think it's just, again, a question of tolerance as the more that works in, um, the better. Let's get all this just off a of shock because we're going to close up here, but there's all this power board and everything. I think we should screw it back in up here tip it the right way round, maybe temporarily put the back back on without screwing it on, tip it the right way up and um, run it a little bit. Oh yeah, also see if we can get in and clean these pots and this socket and then yeah, run it for a bit. Just a little moment of voice over here because I was playing a copyrighted CD. I ran an entire CD on this, quite a long one, and I put the camera on the uh, on the gear there and sometimes it does this really cool little twitch like it's just right on the edge of moving there we go <laughs> that's really cool uh at first i thought it was slipping i kind of looked closely and realized sometimes it just gets right on the edge of needing to do it just as this little twitch but it played a whole cd flawlessly as i say it was a long disc so it ran it right to the end of the sled then the motor came back then i uh ran it to this last track again and uh, out of the CD again. And yeah, it seems to be working all right. So uh, as I said, I think I'm gonna put all the power board back in. Uh, here I'm trying to tap it to make it skip and it took quite a bit of tapping, again, considering it's upside down, half <laughs> off its guts are hanging out. I took quite a bit of tapping to make it skip. It's not flawless because it's an old CD, there's no skip protection, but the tracking and the laser just seems great. No trouble at all. Just a quick bit of voice over here then for uh, refitting the uh, split ring here. This took several attempts to try and sort of get it in place. <laughs> we'll figure out what tools to do it with, but once I got it here, uh, it actually went on really easily. But yeah, it took a good few goes for that to work. Have a look at the door clearance now. Sorted. It's not skewed to one side anymore. 
I'll explain what I've done with some stills for some previous footage. I tried to shoot all this with a close-up camera and you just couldn't see a thing. It was just a rubbish job. So I'll explain. Last night I was looking over this and I think I'd sussed out why the door was kind of bent and rubbing at the side, or the front edge even. And um, long story short, it was because there's two hinges that are held in by three screws along the back. And on this side, I'll include a picture, I'd noticed that a piece of metal, like a piece of brass coloured metal, was sitting in front of this silver piece and I figured it actually should have been behind. What that turned out to be is one of the hinges from the door. If you remove the three screws along the edge on the top here, it removes the door. So um, there's two little hinge flaps there and then the pin that goes through at the top. So the hinge wasn't put back in properly. I looked at this last night, it was getting pretty late and it looked like I'd have to disassemble the entire frame to fix it. So I thought, oh no, I'm gonna look at this after work tomorrow. And then I thought, I'll just pop these three screws out. And because if you ever do this, be aware, because there is underneath, there's a spring there. That's the pressure spring that makes the lid pop up because inside there's a little plastic bit there that presses against the spring so it's what makes it do that you see and now looking at this it has got an ever so slight bend in its door from probably being fitted wrong but that might also be if it might straighten out a little bit if I carefully sort of push it that's actually now not too bad. That's better. That also might be because it's missing, as we mentioned earlier, that strut there. And that's probably missing because the door wouldn't fit together properly. So whoever was messing about with this has probably taken it off <laughs> and got rid of it. But again, it's not super critical, really. It does close fine. Um, it pops open fine. It will be a bit more graceful with the strut, but it doesn't matter. But uh, again, I ran a disc through this last night. Just wants a bit of a polish up and it worked great. It worked fine. I just want to make sure all the uh, cables and everything are laying right. And this cable here that's glued into this top corner when I unpeeled it before this sort of fabric tape that's used all over it, the adhesive on it doesn't really last. If you've peeled it off and you try and stick it back down, there's just no adhesive left. So I ended up using a bit of UHU glue just on the adhesive just to press it in and then rub it with a cotton board on the back of it just to sort of press it back into that corner and get this power board back in. I didn't use Araldite or super glue or anything like that because if I need to take it off again, well, it's going to destroy it. So I don't need that kind of adhesion. The UHU glue would be perfectly fine. So I pushed it right back into that corner. Just got to be careful when you do this that you get adequate clearance underneath from those tiny wires. There's a little bracket there that holds them. That's the bracket that we we're trying to pull out of the way to get the gears in. But uh, yeah, I say I ran this last night. I think now that the um, lubricants had time to settle in, this is getting easier and easier to move. The motor sounds like an old motor but um looking at current draw when that sled moves it's not rocketing up i think it's exactly where it should be i'm going to check as i say all these cables are laying right that they're not caught especially this one got to make sure that that's laying down there properly when the back cover goes on oh i did also where's it gone i did break off the wires from this board, these tiny little wires that come from this battery clip have broken off the points there. So I'm going to resolder those. That was inevitable. I should have just frankly broken them off to begin with. It wouldn't have been flapping around all the time. Just going to check which way around they go and put that back in. Okay, it's all back together, all polished up. It's got a few marks on it. It's not a showpiece. I mean, it's almost as old as I am and I've got a few scars as well. Uh, I'm as surprised as anyone else that this needed no electrical or optical adjustment whatsoever. Um, I wasn't about to dive into that if it worked. 
Bearing in mind this is a CD player from 1989, if this plays a commercially pressed disc without fault, I'm not about to start tweaking it to make it play CDRs or anything. I don't know if I've actually got a CDR to hand, I will test one, um, see if it will play it, I'm not too bothered. Um, I also had no intention from the start of adding a battery to this. There are some people that have made modern battery packs that will fit into it, usually lithium ion. Um, that will be able to power it. The issue I've got with putting a battery in is that you're never going to make this a truly portable player because adding a battery won't add a skip buffer. You know, you're not going to add ESP to it. Uh, so it's never going to be a player that you're going to carry around, unlike maybe a tape Walkman where you know you might take that out and pop that in the pocket. This is going to stay as a piece for the desk and uh, it's just going to be run straight off the 9 volt power. It's a real eye-opener when you look at the current drawer on these that we, even when it idles it pulls 40 milliamps when it's playing a disc it's pulling anywhere between 210 and 260 milliamps um, you can really appreciate the the later models which were tweaked for running on AA batteries for example or a rechargeable pack in that format uh, they really had to get the chipset and laser and motor current draw down uh, quite significantly to be able to get you know any sensible use out of those at all uh, it, when it's spinning up it pulls about half an amp uh, so even at nine volts so yeah it's pretty thirsty uh, again it's from 1989 as i said earlier just the the kind of premium feel of this is, I think, and the clean design of it is what makes it. Love this detail of the, the polished ring around the uh, around the top there. It takes a lot of its styling cues from Sony's very first models, and uh, it's lovely that it's got that lineage to it while being a little bit more modern. Love the backlight on the front. I did manage to polish out a couple of little marks here and there. The only thing I wish they'd done on this black model is the way they've done the silver Sony logo, which is a raised logo. The Discman logo is also raised, but it's black. I wish they'd um, polished that out the same as they've done the Sony logo, because the Walkman, for example, the Walkman branding is silver. So that's the only thing, because it has started to wear away a little bit on these. If I was confident in doing it, I could think of a method that would be safe. I would try and remove that black on the Discman logo. Uh, see if it could be abraded out somehow and take it back to the silver like that but that would probably be a terrible idea to, <laughs> to attempt it does have a little bit of wear around the buttons around here you can see in certain lights I did get a little bit of a mark out from the front you can't really see that the backlight on the display is a bit dim but that's probably just how they were um, but it still all works the volume control and headphone output cleaned up easy with a little bit of switch cleaner They're giving me no trouble at all uh, if you'd had this in 1989, you'd have been an absolute king, I'm sure. Um, it wouldn't have been cheap. I had a D133 for Christmas 1995, I think it was, which was uh, about probably 100 quid in an Argos catalogue, you know. Uh, all plastic bodied. I loved it. It worked great. It didn't have a skip buffer either. But... <laughs> But I had a Sony Discman when I was a kid, you know, how cool was that? Um, you can tell that although internally, as I said, the improvements they've made to make them run from uh, AA batteries, I think it had a rechargeable pack that gave three hours that came with it so it could recharge. And uh, you could put standard alkaline batteries in it and get about seven or eight hours, I think, which is really impressive. Um, but And I don't have it anymore, unfortunately. It, completely died it got thrown away a few years ago because they're not uncommon if I ever wanted another one um, but you can I can still kind of feel the and hear the door popping up on that <laughs> in my mind uh, and it was all sort of plastic body the design is very kind of blobby mid 90s it's not got the styling flair that these got and when they got onto those much later uh, kind of end of run units which were uh, very thin, they ran on the gumstick batteries, very low power consumption. They kind of got the design flare back a little bit. Um, some of those now are quite desirable. Uh, some of them will do MP3 and 
A track formats and all sorts of uh, all sorts of stuff. But a couple of those models uh, are now quite desirable now. And yeah, I feel like they've got that kind of premium feel, premium design, uh, flair back to them really. So one day I might look for a, a, one or two of those. I'll see. Depends on the price. Um, but yeah, this has uh, been really fun to do. I hope that's helpful for someone else. And uh, thanks for watching.